When I was about to finish my PhD research, I got to fly to Japan to attend a robotics conference to present my project. Back then, I have been working on surgical robots, and it was a robot that could cut out puzzle pieces of bone using a powerful laser. The idea was that a physician, a neurosurgeon, for example, could cut out pieces of the skull, remove them, remove a brain tumor, and then put these bone pieces back together to, cut, um, to close the skull up. The robot I was using was an industrial-sized robot, a robot that you would find in a car manufacturing plant, about the same size as myself, actually. Now, that trip to Japan was also my very first time being so far away from home. I was terrified and excited, both at the same time. I remember that I was seeing these beautiful and sacred temples. I ate food that I've never eaten before. I was surrounded by all these unfamiliar traditions, and I was welcomed by very generous people. One day at that conference, um, a young professor from Nashville is up, ne up next. He goes up stage and starts talking about his idea on building a small tentacle-like robot from what looked to me essentially like tiny drinking straws. Interestingly, everyone else in the audience wasn't really paying attention. They were looking to their laptops, talking to their neighbors. No one actually seemed to notice what I did. I felt like lightning struck me. I had this immediate urge to know more about this research and this idea. More significantly, I was thinking about my giant laser robot and felt, that's a mistake. But interestingly, everybody else at that robotics conference was cheering me and was saying, wow, this great innovation. But after listening to this, I was like, mm, there had to be a better way. Why do we need to make the skull open after seeing these small worm-like robots? There had to be a better way to get to the center of your brain. Today, I am a roboticist and a professor here at the University of Toronto. And together with my team... <laughs> thank you. Together with my team, we have taken that idea from Japan further than anybody could have imagined. Through your nose, into your brain. And this story about how I got to build small surgical robots after building big ones is also a story about how you could look at the world and see something different from everyone else, even something that could change an entire field of thinking. Now, for much of my life, my journey actually felt quite lonely. I was often the only girl in science classes that were filled with boys. Even my teachers looked surprised to see me. I was also the first person in my whole family to attend university. So I was completely unprepared in my introduction to computer science course. I was sitting in a lecture hall, 600 students around me, double the size as we're here today. And my professor would stand there and say, hmm, look to your left, to your right. One of you will succeed in this program. Now, I looked around and felt, wow, everybody else is so much smarter than myself, so much more entitled to pursue an academic education than me, a first-generation student. But I hid my fear. I just studied really hard. I worked as if my life would depend on it. I prepared for every meeting, every exam, every encounter with a professor, as if it was the last meeting I had in my life. I felt like I shouldn't be there, and so I didn't want anybody else to notice that. And for a while, that actually worked quite well. Uh, working on my own, studying really hard, actually prepared me quite well for research, which is all about facing the unknown. And it is the research that really lit a spark in me. I was invited to participate in the surgical robotics project as an undergraduate student, and then I was even asked to continue working with them as a grad for my graduate studies. And it was a trip to Japan 
that really had a huge impact on me. Before going there, I was working on these surgical robots, working with physicians and thinking about how could we use traditional robots to help them do their job better in surgery. And I returned from Japan with this completely new outlook. What if a traditional style robot wasn't the answer? Now, do you ever get into a flow state? This is how I felt when I thought about the idea of building a robot no one has built before. When I'm in this state, I know that I am onto something. I just can't stop thinking about it. Time just passes and I don't notice. This is a feeling which I encounter as my inner compass. When I'm in that state, I know this is what I had to do. And it's a fun fact, like my husband, he notices when I am in this state. Sometimes he would just come by and ask me if I wanted to eat or drink something because he hasn't heard from me for hours. Um, and I wouldn't respond, but he doesn't get mad. He would actually just smile and be like, Jessica, you're in this work tunnel, I come back later. <laughs> but it is not all about having a great idea and believing in yourself. I actually... Um, returned to Germany, where I was from, and I started lecturing students about everything I knew in robotics. I um, started a laboratory, and I had soon a huge team of bright and amazing people working with me. We were all so excited about building these small robots that nobody has ever built. But that wasn't enough. We would build a world's first robot. Roboticists worldwide would congratulate us and be like, wow, this is great. But interestingly, my immediate colleagues at the university, they weren't convinced. They were looking down at us and say, we do things differently here. You and your robots don't fit. I even remember this moment talking to a senior colleague after I returned from an award ceremony where our work was um, acknowledged. And he would look at me and say, don't flatter yourself too much. You received this award because you're female. And so it were these people, my immediate colleagues, that would actually constitute my ability to advance at that university doing the things I wanted to do. It felt like a wall that even I couldn't break through. I felt that they were putting me into this small box. And I could feel in this box, my spark that was lighting others would dim. Did I work all that hard, all my life, to be put in a box? Did I create this great team of people to be told, you don't fit? How dare you trying to keep me small? And so I left. I leaned on the support of my husband, my students, my team, roboticists worldwide, my family, and I joined my new colleagues here at the University of Toronto. And now, we are building things. Wait a second. <laughs> We are building robots like this. Robots that are as small in diameter as your pinky. Robots that are fundamentally different in their structure from traditional robots. These robots don't have any rigid links or joints. When you look closely, you will notice the inner core of these robots is composed of flexible tubes. It's the tubes that I learned about in Japan. We use these tubes to change the lengths of these bending segments as they're moving. And we use these tendons that are routed along this robot, pulling them at the back to induce these bending motions. We build these robots from scratch. They just simply don't exist yet. And it doesn't stop there. We are also deriving all sorts of mathematical equations to explore how is this robot moving into places that it 
robots have never moved before. And we work on controllers to help users operate this robot as easily as a character in a video game. And we call these robots continuum robots because they are curvilinear and continuously bending. And this is completely transforming the field of robotics because this is not how we have built robots before. These robots can move into the most confined spaces. They can simply sneak in. Now, think about such a robot carrying a surgical tool, navigating its way up your nostril, and removing a brain tumor that's lifeless threatening to you, removing a blood clot after a stroke, without the need to open your skull. It doesn't have to be medical. Um, think about this robot inspecting every inch on the inside of a jet engine to make sure that your next, si next, next flight is safe. There are so many possibilities with Continuum robots. Now, you may wonder, what does that mean for me? Can I build things nobody imagined? And I would say, yes, you can. And I have three pieces of advice for you. The first one. Recognize that you may feel alone on this journey. I had to realize you can't actually do it all alone. You don't need to white knuckle through everything. And the key is to find a community of like-minded people. It is so much easier to ask in this community for help. Second, consider the possibility that you could leave too. Leaving my former university was tremendously empowering to me. I realized that I am in control. If you don't have support at your workplace, in your community, in your family, you do not have to accept this. And third, calibrate your inner compass. You probably have that feeling of flow or this work tunnel, too. Trust your inner feelings. I'm sure that they will guide you. And now, let's just look at this world. It's our opportunity space. Let's just build things nobody imagined. Thank you. <laughs>